For those of you just joining us, welcome back to the Geek Peak Podcast. We're excited to break down episode seven of House of the Dragon and discuss a few new dragon riders this week. So very quickly, let's raise a glass to the rightful queen, Rhaenyra. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. House Black. Long live the queen. Okay. So. Um. Let's let's get into this. We're gonna run this a little differently because uh, Trent's not here this week, and uh, and I think I think I got this covered. So, Bran, first thoughts. Um, of I like episode it. of episode seven, unnamed. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I liked it. It is definitely shaking some things up. We are seeing. Things we've never seen before, and whether it be House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones, now that we have some dragon riders that aren't from directly the noble house of Targaryen. Mm hmm. Bastards. Bastards. I wouldn't be surprised if this is called like Army of the Bastards or something like that. Bastard Nation, rise up. Bastard riders, calling it. I could do that. Uh, yeah. So was was that all your uh, your first thoughts? I'm also uh, first thoughts. Some of the writers that are revealed this episode were a little shocking. One, it makes sense because they've been showing his character almost a lot. every episode now. It feels yeah. like it's like why do they keep showing this guy? And it, once they were talking about bringing bastards from King's Landing over, like oh, okay, this makes a lot more sense. And the other one, I, I will just say it. Oh, I thought that he was just talking out of his ass when he was in the bar. I didn't think he actually had any kind of Targaryen lineage to him. But I was I'd, proven wrong. I didn't think so at first, and then he—I don't know. It started to feel like there was some credence to it, just based on the storytelling when Jason Rhaenyra had that conversation in Dragonstone with all the scrolls. It started yeah. really coming together. I was kind of hoping that, like, uh, so the other one being, obviously, we're, I mean, we're going to be talking about the whole episode, Hugh Hammer. Um, I had a feeling, like, okay, he'll be a writer for sure. Yeah. And I thought they were going to try to do, like, okay, Ulf, he's supposed to be the second writer, and he attempts to tame one of the dragons. He's like, oh, maybe it is true. And then, no, it's not true. And he's he's cut down or he's he's swallowed alive. But no, he he was actually is a dragon rider now. So surprise, well, surprise. For me, first thoughts. Um, really enjoyed it. Definitely one of the stronger episodes of the season. I really, really wanted to see some more soldier or dragon or ship combat in this episode as being the penultimate with yeah, how much was, time we've spent building to it, you know, well, especially with the track record that we have with penultimate episodes in game of Thrones and house of the dragon. Usually you do expect there to be some really big battle or twist that you don't see coming. That's going to kind of rock the next season. Like it's going to, you're going to feel those reverberations where yeah. in this one, yeah, we do get that just not in the form of a battle. Yeah. And, uh, you know, major, major plot movement, but I just am craving when this starts to really come to a head, we've gotten some tastes of it, uh, but it hasn't, it hasn't really come to fruition yet. So, um, that's kind of how I was feeling. I thought the, when all the bastard riders go in to the dragon chamber was an insane scene. I loved that part. Very cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, this was a, this was a major leap forward in terms of story, uh, like moving the plot forward because of, I mean, you touched on two dragon riders, but really we have a potential for a third that I think they've pretty clearly set up. Well, we just got to, uh, the first, I guess, technically, was last episode, where we have Adam claiming sea smoke. Yes, but, but I agree. I, there was a potential for another one as well, being uh, Reyna. Is that her name? I thought it was Bela. I get the two sisters. Bela's the one that's up. already that already has a dragon. I believe it's Reyna. 
Yeah. But I absolutely think we're leading up to her, you know, claiming that wild dragon is her mm-hmm. own. <clears throat> um, he might be right. So, all right. That's our first thoughts. Uh, overall, is, Kayla, you are great, correct. great episode. Um, I would have liked to, to have seen a little bit more seeing as it is the penultimate, but let's see the finale. Normally what they do is like the crazy episode is the penultimate and the, the finale is an entire setup episode. That episode felt very much like a setup episode. Mm-hmm. Even though it did have some, some action in it. So I'm interested to see um, kind of where they go on that. Uh, positives of this episode for me. And, uh, and I talked with Trent before, before we recorded this. So he got his thoughts in here a little bit too, but, uh, we both agreed. And I want to ask you, Brandon, the sound design, especially with the dragons, like specifically every single dragons, like different kind of noises and roars and this, that, and the other. I thought that was awesome. Yeah. I saw he was posting that. While the episode was going on in our <laughs> chat, and he was creaming his pants over the sound design of the dragons. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they're awesome. They sound great. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, by the way, peeps, we're going to just play the trailer in the background so that you guys can have some eye candy in addition to me and Brandon's beautiful faces. Yeah. But uh, I, I thought that looked great. I thought the CGI in this was fantastic. Like all the dragons look really, really well done. Vermithor looks so awesome. Yeah, dude. And I'm happy Vermithor and Hugh ended up together. That seems like a good pairing. I agree. Hugh seems like a, a good guy with a good head on his shoulders. Yeah. So it's, I think it's, that's important considering Vermithor's the second biggest dragon in the realm that we know about. Yes, HBO Max actually just posted out this uh, this graphic, this infographic. Let me see if I can pull it up. But <coughs> excuse me, it's basically the new um, dragons being introduced, and it's like stat sheets for each each one. Um, let's see. Oh man, I'm not going to be able to find it, of course, right now. But it is fantastic. I think. The introduction of new dragons is so important. The blacks were down bad. It was looking pretty dire for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, it was really what it was. <coughs> Irax, Caraxes, maybe if <laughs> Damon decides to help out. I was gonna say he's having his vision quest. Yeah, and then you have Ursus dragon, and you have Bela's dragon, which those are both younger dragons. Yeah, uh, so Thor, here we go. I found the post. Its uh, nickname is the Bronze Fury. Mm-hmm. And that's all the info they got right now for him. But Silver Wing. Do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we didn't know his nickname was the Bronze Fury. They said it. Really? Yep. I did not hear that. Um,. Yeah, I mean, they just have photos of all three, and they look awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so besides the sound design, let's talk about some of the big things that happened in this episode. So one of the things, it kind of gets oversha- overshadowed by everything else that goes down, but how about that conversation between Laris and Aegon, and obviously the maester trying to help like give him PT basically to help him walk again and him falling yeah, down where Laris is like, no, we need to push him. He needs to keep being stronger. Uh, I mean, it makes sense considering that it seems like Laris has kind of put all of his cards on the table. He's no longer going to be trying to appeal to Eamon because Eamon doesn't want anything to do with him. Really. He kind of threw him aside instantly when he, when Laris tried to, offer him his assistance to be his hand and now he's like all right well Aegon may still want me as a hand if i decide to be pivotal to his recovering the club foot yeah, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely because he knows it's he knows it too well what it is to be a cripple to kind of help guide him along this new journey in his life well let's talk about that for a second so 
his conversation with a- uh, Aegon as well as with the Grand Maester showing that he is act like on one side he's like oh Grand Maester you're pushing him too hard you shouldn't be doing that by yourself blah 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 but then behind his back yeah we need to like double down on this shit mm-hmm. and then separate from that conversation mm-hmm. we had him talking with that person who Sir Wild is also Sir- on the council was he mm-hmm I've never seen that guy before. He's on the he's on the Greens Council. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Well, he comes with, to Laris with news from from his squire. Yeah, yeah. Hit hit him with it. Tell us what it is. Yeah. Uh, sea smoke has been seen with a new rider, which it's interesting that Laris kind of disregards this one because it's. He's like, oh, I heard it from my squire, who heard it from his father, who heard it from his assistant, who heard it from <laughs> third <laughs> uncle's cousin, whatever it may be. <laughs> I heard it through the grapevine. Exactly how to go. take that. Is it something that Laris believes is true and is deciding to withhold from Aemon? Or is it something that he just doesn't he just doesn't believe in general because it's never happened before. So I think that he did believe it. I think that he intentionally withheld the information for two reasons. One, if Amond rides off to war and Vagar gets killed because he gets jumped by three dragons or an extra dragon, Sea Smoke has a new rider. Good. That's that's a win for Aegon. Mm-hmm. Two, I think that the likelihood of it being true outweighs it being not true, but it doesn't benefit him at all to deliver that news because he's not going to get in the good graces of Amon. True. Also, as far as we know, at this point in time, the only real potential rider it could be would be Reyna, who doesn't have a dragon, and yeah. she's already tried her hand at Sea Smoke. And so maybe Laris is like, oh no, this... Maybe maybe she finally got Sea Smoke to fall under her command, or I also think there's the Otto High Tower component of Laris' scheming where he's like, I like Otto is inbound to come and take over his hand of the king, and whatever mess is there when he comes, he's gonna have to inherit. Is he inbound though? Cause it seemed to me like they couldn't get a hold of him. Well, he had gone... Like they're searching for him still, and he hasn't he had, been responding to any ravens. He had gone to Highgarden, remember? Mm-hmm. And he was recruiting them to supply food, I imagine. I think that's what it was. But... As far as I know, though, we haven't heard a response from Otto saying that he's actually coming back to King's Landing yet. I'm sure he will, though. If he's called, he will. He's a man of honor, even though he's kind of a snake. He's a man of duty, I should say. No. He's not necessarily a man of honor. But, um, yeah, no, I, I I, think that Laris making it a point to not let it be known is a two-pronged thing for him, you know? Destabilize. I mean, Laris is currently playing the game better than anyone else, in my opinion. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so... In addition to Laris and Aegon and Sir Wild, who I didn't know was on the council, uh, and I think Trent asked the same thing last week too. He's like, "Who the hell is that guy that keeps popping up?" Also, new dragon rider who this, and I think it's funny that you said like, um, like how it was like uh, a rumor told from a shipmate's like cousins, shopkeepers, sisters, yeah. husband or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's just <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, cool. And I'm a Targaryen. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So an interesting conversation that was had is jumping over to Dragonstone, Rhaenyra and Jace. I think they're a Dragonstone. Dragonstone yep. or Driftmark, right? No, they're a Dragonstone. Dragonstone. Okay. So they're a Dragonstone. <clears throat> and they're they're back in this this uh scroll room with everyone's genealogies, basically. Mm-hmm. And Jace is 
pissed. Now, granted, we we kind of jumped ahead of the the encounter between Rhaenyra and Adam, but I think really the the broad strokes of that were Adam has agreed to be subservient to Queen Rhaenyra. He uh, she's taking him into service under him, basically, and that's gonna rub a lot of people's cheeks. Chapped, you know. They don't like that because Game of Thrones, House of the Dragons, and even in the real world, the noble houses of long wealth and power don't take kindly to new money or new, yeah. you know, new found Especially celebrity. small folk being lifted up. Yeah. It's not usually accepted. Yep. So... Adam and her have a conversation and, you know, he in earnest says that he, he will serve her. I think, I think he's being genuine. I don't, I don't see any I reason so to, I mean, his, his, well, it's not confirmed still, but I, I find it to be pretty obvious that his father is Corliss and he's a bastard of Corliss. Um, oh yeah. It's not confirmed. Although they have a scene where Corliss walks in and is like, well done and kind of like gives him the the nod like i see you you're doing you're doing well well he has um, conversations with alan about their shared father uh, yeah so I, have they said shared father yeah he said our father at least he pays attention to you like he's talked about his resentment to the fact that he gets no mind from their shared dad i must have missed that because i thought they had a shared mother but i wasn't sure if it was a shared father or not mm -hmm. okay fair enough um Corliss be clapping cheeks. Well, only the same woman. Maybe. <laughs> if they're, I mean, if they're brothers under the same mom, then they would only one lady there. Who knows if there's others? But um, sure. all that to say, it makes sense that Adam would bend the knee pretty much immediately to her near, considering Corliss is her hand. He has always worked under Corliss. His brother, Alan, is also working under Corliss, which. I think it's also interesting we get a scene where after Corliss learns that Adam has taken a dragon, he goes to Alan like, listen, maybe maybe you should try your hand and also claim a dragon. This is something that's never been done before, but your brother just did it. And Adam, or Alan, is firmly, I am of salt and sea. So I think it's pretty clear that he is going to be the one that's named the heir to Driftmark. Considering yeah. that that was a big point between Corliss and Bela when they spoke, when she's like, "I'm of I'm of blood and fire," and here is Alan saying, "I am of sea and salt." So, I mean, honestly, I think that she, I I thought it was kind of funny. She clearly was like, "Dude, what is going on? Like, who is this person? I'm, are we under attack? Like." She just is so like yeah, confused. It makes, sense. it makes sense to at first be like, "What the hell is happening?" Yeah. It's never happened before, and she just tried it with who she thought would be best for the role, because it's someone with Targaryen lineage. Yes, it was like a great great grandmother that was a Targaryen princess, but he's from a noble house, and that's the best that she knows. She doesn't know that lowborn small folk even have a chance to do this, even if their their ties to that lineage is stronger un until now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so one of the interesting things about Rhaenyra and Jace fighting, kind of jumping back to that, that original point that I was making, is that Jace says something very, like, cringy, skin crawly when he refers to Lowborn as mongrels. That was... It's that was... Connecting. It's you think because he knows that he's he's a bastard. He even says so. He knows that, and I think it's also because he's concerned that okay, we give these lowborns dragons. They also are bastards of House Targaryen. What gives yeah. them even like a, a lesser right than I to the throne? Should something happen to you, what gives me the highest claim? Which I would say you have the highest claim because you are d directly Rhaenyra's heir. I mean, in reality, though, it's like they're not. They're not going to win the war as it stands. 
So some sacrifices are going to have to be made. Some decisions are going to have to be made. And this is clearly a providential thing in the in the sense of this guy being willing to, to swear allegiance to Rhaenyra right off the bat without any kind of complaints. Agreed. But this also, she wants to continue this venture, finding other lowborn to also take up the mantle of Dragon Rider. Who's to yeah. say that some of the ones that she brings in aren't going Don't to turn they may they may bend the knee at the time but who knows what their true intentions are later on now they have a dragon now they're a direct threat to the throne and claim should something happen and it could start a whole nother war so i understand his frustration and i do his, too I, again i find it it was a projection saying lowborn because he also knows he's a bastard he says he even says like he mentions uh sir strong going into rainier's bed and like i'm not an idiot i know what i am and so daddy issues um Mommy issues <laughs> both yeah yeah all right well let's talk about allison's vision quest to the forest let's talk about her trip to electric forest yeah i don't know i don't know why we needed to see any of this really i know why we did oh uh, yeah because we love allison Do we right, know. Around, right around here Right around, right around Vision Quest Zone. Say so we see her go take a holiday weekend out in the forest. She camps for a little bit, walks into the middle of a lake, decides to swim around for a bit. Horror sees movie vibes. <laughs> sees a bird. Sees a bird and is like, you know what? I think I'm better now. She's like, I saw this bird, sir. Alexander like, Bird, sir. I'm not sure I know what her purpose is. I don't think she knows what her purpose is anymore in the show at this point. I guess it would be to bring on Daron to King's Landing and kind of kind of lift him up, her third son. Yeah. <clears throat> because right now, I mean, Aegon is completely To help, she could help. I mean, once Otto, I do think, is coming back and once he does, she will have a role. I hope so. I love because, Otto. Because she... Her and Otto have been working towards the same goal the whole time. You know, yeah, d despite their house, the council. Yeah. Uplift their house and also bring peace to the land. But at the same time, since Otto has been gone, her house has rejected her. <laughs> like Both Aegon and Aemon have not been good to her. Yeah. Well, the wrong people have influence, like Chris and Cole. It's true. You know? But... <clears throat> Let's talk about, so, I mean, you, I didn't really get anything else from her trip out there to the Kingswood. You know, she went just with one, one King's guard. That's not her fuck it buddy. Felt like a spirit quest type thing where she needed to find herself again. And I mean, she again, mentioned that she may not go back uh, yeah, earlier in the episode. I think that <laughs> that is how it started. And then once she had whatever that revelation was, she had while floating in the lake. I think she will return. And again, it may be to either help Aegon through his suffering and like help him with his recovery. Or maybe after speaking with her brother, she's like, okay, well, maybe I haven't spent any time with Daron. He sounds like a nice boy. He's, he's well liked. He's kind. Maybe she's going to kind of throw her, you know, throw Mother. her hat in that court. She's going to throw her motherhood behind him. <clears throat> yeah. She's like, you know what? I failed. Yeah, I've been a great so mother so far to my other two sons. Can't you tell? So <laughs> let me like, fuck up your life too. These two were absolute botch jobs, but let me be your mom now. Now that you're like <laughs> functioning, let me get in that life. Say, oh, you're kind, are you? I'll fix that. Yeah. Too bad for you. <laughs> um, Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're actually spot on there. I'm interested to see that. I don't think we see Darren Daron in this season. But, I don't think uh, so, with only one episode being left. Yeah, I think it would be a waste to introduce him. I think he needs a little bit of time if he's going to be a player. Or maybe unless, it'll be a big reveal for the last episode. Unless he just gets cut down like a little pleb. Um, all right, so let's talk about... Let's talk about dragons. <laughs> Let's talk, about, let's talk about dragons. Let's talk about new dragon riders. So 
Let's go with the one that hasn't been confirmed yet, but uh, is arguably the most intriguing based on the fact that, you know, she has been raised around a family with dragons is probably the most is going to end up being probably the most capable rider right off the bat. Just, and like be mo kind of the most familiar with dragon lore and speaking high Valyrian and all that good stuff. And that's, did we confirm if it's Baylor or Lena? Mm -hmm. Well, it's Re <laughs> how, how can I never get her name right? Like there's three. Reina. I I know, but there's three ladies, and I said every single one, but like I said, the mom and her sister, <laughs> but not hers. Yeah. Uh, um. But yeah, I think Reina is going to end up getting that wild dragon well, that we've been introduced to, uh, by Lady Aaron of the Vale. Yeah, I agree. I think it that makes a lot of sense considering she had no luck. Sea smoke, which not at this point, sea smoke's taken, and it seems strange to me that they would set up that plot point. I feel like they've been very. Here's a plot point. Here's a solution to that. With this season so far, it's all kind of been set up pretty well. By even with the other dragon riders that we were introduced to, and and Adam, like this is something that has been building up. Why would you talk about a wild dragon being in the veil if it if she's not going to be the one to tame it? You know. Yeah. Apparently, that dragon in the veil's name is Sheep Stealer. <laughs> well, it does steal sheep. Maybe it'll get a better name once it's tamed. <laughs> sheep Stealer. Yeah. No, I'm interested. Uh, let's see. So, all right. Do we want to go source material? I don't want to get too... She's getting this dragon. I think it's, like, safe to say that you and I both agree. I think it's pretty clear. Anybody who's watching out there, like, she's getting the dragon. Go ahead and accept that. Or, shocker, she dies, but I doubt that happens. Um, that would be a shocker. So, one of the one of the dragons is called Sheep Stealer, a uh, large male dragon. He in the books is claimed by a Targaryen bastard named Nettles, who tames him by feeding him sheep until he trusts her. She hasn't been seen yet in House of the Dragon, but it's people are assuming that that's going to be the take on Sheep Stealer. But I kind of feel like maybe Nettles is not going to end up. So maybe being... Nettles is going to be replaced by Reyna. Yes. The show? Yes. But people are saying that it should probably be. Because Reyna has her own dragon in the books called Morning. Mm, I see. So, I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, yeah. I think, overall, it's an exciting prospect for her to get a dragon. I like her character. She's been taking good care of those kids. Having to deal, put up with Lady Aaron's bullshit. Well, it's get funny, her. too, that she's deciding just now to try this as their company is leaving and being sent to Pentos. It's like one last ditch effort. So I think it has to happen next episode, you know? Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about dragon rider too. We've touched a lot on him, but, uh, let's talk about Adam, Adam of Hull mm -hmm. or AKA Adam Valerian. So well, he's a bastard. I don't think he gets the name. Unless yeah. He but Unless he's Corliss grants it to him like uh yeah. like Ramsey. Yeah, but he is he is Valerian blood. So he's he is a bastard. Important to to know. But um anything that we haven't said about him. I mean, I actually already really like his character. He seems kind of like like I'm stoked to see someone kind of not of royal blood. I mean, that's he, all the new Dragon Riders. It, it's a bunch of people that are have always been lowborn, that have always had, for the most part, kind of terrible lives or lives that are just not of luxury. I would say Adam's probably not as bad as the other two because yeah. at least he's under the care of Corliss and like working with him. Um, yeah. But, I mean, just to be elevated to this new position of Dragon Rider, it's going to be a huge boon for anyone. And now... 
I, I like the points they were making when they were calling for potential Targaryen bastards in King's Landing to make their their trip out to Dragonstone because like this could change everything for you. You'll be you'll be a legend. You'll be written in the history books for forever. You're now a dragon rider for which, Ulf. Yeah, for Ulf, and yeah. I mean even for for Hugh. I mean, that's not what, exactly what he wanted, but not for that in particular. Yeah, but to now be able to help protect his wife if his wife will even have him at this point. She's like, you you ride what? I mean, that was a big reveal also that the daughter that was sick, they lost her. That was sad. Yeah. That was a sad detail. Um, Yeah, I, I'm excited to learn more about Adam. I feel like we learned a good bit about Alan through the pa- last couple episodes. And I very much am... Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of kind of how he carries himself so far. He seems like he's going to be a fun character to watch. Um, yep. Let's talk about Ulf. You know, like you said, he kind of had that whole bully situation in the uh, in the tavern in King's Landing in Flea Bottom, mm-hmm. or was it the Street of Silk? I, I don't even really know. Either way, but. Uh, so Ulf is, you know, we, we, we saw him probably five, four or five episodes back now, and he claims to be a Targaryen prince. We think he's full of shit and turns out, or a, a Targaryen princeling, uh, it turns out he actually is of Targaryen blood, son of a gun. He didn't lie. Um, and we'll kind of get into the whole scene of how that actually happens, but it's interesting because he has kind of the difference between him and Adam is that Adam has always sought his father's approval and his father has like done a little for him, but never a lot. And more Mm -hmm. so for Alan for Ulf. It seems like he's always tried to like brandish the Targaryen name about as some sense of nobility because or like some level of nobility well it's it's like a it's a drinking story it helps him make friends at the bars that he frequents it helps him get free drinks from his friends and just tell all these outlandish stories that they're not necessarily true until they are now you know yeah and even then i i feel like so his his claim when he first was saying that he was of targaryen lineage he was saying that he was essentially a stepbrother to Viserys and Damon. So he would have been one of um, Balon's bastards. Mm. Um, interesting. And I think it's interesting too, that when he's the call to action is set forth in King's Landing, he is very apprehensive. I don't know if he actually necessarily believes in his own stories at that point. It's like, what, what if I'm not like, yeah. what if I've just been telling myself this for all these years? And, and just because uh, I have blonde hair. Yeah, and I and I have no no Targaryen in me at all. And I I think even when he's at the Dragon Pits, in uh in Dragonstone, and things start to go down, I don't think he's very confident there either. Even no. when he gets to the point where he's in front of uh Silverwing, right? Yeah. Even when he's in front of Silverwing, he kind of like lays back, opens up his arms, like accepting his fate. Yeah. And it turns out, Silverwing chooses him as the writer. And that actually, so <clears throat> Trent was complaining about that because he was saying that he didn't like, like one of the things that they've shown so far on how to try to have a dragon select you is that you need to not show fear. And he was like totally terrified. Um, but I think it well, just goes to show that no fear. Like I'm willing, I'm, this is my time. I'm done. Like he just like opens up to it. Like there's no fear there. He's, he's kind of. He's ready to, to die. I also don't think that fear has anything to do with the dragon picking its rider. I think that that's just that's like... That's true. I mean, we don't really know how a dragon chooses its rider. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. But um, I did very much appreciate that Ulf did not die and that his stories were not BS. And if he does ever get a chance to go back to that pub in Flea Bottom and... He gets a cool scene later too, which we'll get to at the end of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, last so, but 
before we get into the last dragon rider when ulf does run into silverwing and he's walking through uh the cave is that a dragon egg that he steps on and breaks it's a like uh i think it's like a cocoon that the eggs are in like a clutch Mm -hmm. that keeps it warm so he when he steps in it it breaks open the chamber that it's inside of but it doesn't break the egg because i was wondering (laughs) The, the the silver wing think that he hatched from that egg and, and that's one of the reasons that she was <laughs> cool with him no i don't think so i don't, I don't know. know i think that's I think... my baby right there get on my back let's ride yeah well i felt bad for that poor ugly fucker that got burnt to death immediately i mean he had no chance to be really <laughs> him and the whole crowd he kind of looks like Aegon at this point i that think that was like that I think you're that not, was intentional, you're not be on this actually. Show very long. I think it was intentional that he looked like Aegon. Yeah. Because he did. Like, after Aegon had been burnt and disfigured. It's true. Uh, this whole scene where they are putting all of the small folk that have come from King's Landing in front of Vermithor. Very intense. And it felt like it was. The way that uh, Rhaenyra kind of just went upstairs and sat there and watched it all, it felt almost like it was a sacrifice that she's just willing to make. Just be like, all right, all of them can burn, essentially, as long as one <laughs> can claim Vermithor. It was like ritual sacrifice. Yeah, it pretty much was. I mean, she's ready to do what she has to do, clearly. Yeah. So is Damon, which we'll get into in, in a minute here. Mm-hmm. Um. So let's talk about let's talk about our guy. This is my favorite dragon rider. I'm most excited to see this guy because I feel like he's got a direct reason to want to kill the Greens and seek vengeance and mm-hmm. take and take control of King's Landing with or, and put Rhaenyra in power. He's seen what Rhaenyra does. He's seen what Aemon and Aegon have done, and he picks Rhaenyra. So Hugh, Hugh. Hugh, Hugh Hammer. Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. Yeah, so this guy, if you listen to our episodes from like, what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, he kept mm-hmm. cropping up and we're like, dude, what is this guy going to do? Is he going to build the scorpions that are used to shoot the dragons down for Rhaenyra? Like, are they going to equip Dragonstone with that? Like, what's going to happen? Because it was clear that he was going to defect or do something drastic. Yeah, I mean, they kept showing him. He's like, he's going to play a big role. What that role is right now remains to be seen. Yeah, but he's clearly important. They keep showing him. And boy, does he have a role to play now. I even thought he might sabotage the things that he built for the king. Yeah, but so now our boy Hugh, after tragically losing his daughter. Uh, due to lack of food and medicine and stuff uh, because of the war, has come to Dragonstone to claim his very own dragon. And I actually, I thought him claiming his dragon was the coolest scene too. Mm -hmm. Like that part where he is, when everyone starts getting burnt to death and everyone's just running and he takes cover behind that rock and there's a lady back down there with him that he ends up saving which first off noble thing to do love very him. noble and then he's like screaming in the face of the dragon like i love this guy and he gets the biggest one like yeah this guy's about to be super legit i can't wait to see this dude we need to be tormented on a dragon which is sick we needed like <laughs> yeah right we needed a good guy like an actual good guy on a dragon mm-hmm. there wasn't one like through and through good character that rode a dragon. Like Rhaenyra is selfish at times. Jaceres is Jaceres has been pretty good so far, but everybody else, they've been very quick to use their dragon for their own means. Damon, I don't even want to talk about yet. <laughs> uh all right, let's get into him. Um anything else you want to say about Hugh? I think uh, it, there's not much more to say as of yet, but I, I am will agree with you that he is the one that I'm most excited to see come up as a dragon rider. 
Yeah, absolutely. I really like his character, and I really like the actor that's playing him. I totally agree. Sorry, I'm responding to someone on our Instagram uh, saying saying they think the brother, Adam's brother, is going to get uh, anointed. I think so, too. I think Alan will become a de facto Valorian and also become the heir to Driftmark at some point. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. So it's time. Oh, last thing I wanted to say that scene when he does hide behind the rock, tell me that that didn't feel like the scene in Jurassic Park when the T-Rex comes out. <laughs> like does. that, that thing looks like the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. It, it was awesome. It de definitely had like a horror vibe to it. And they did a good job of showing how scary a dragon can be. Um, once again, you know, obviously just we burning also everything even, alive is scary. We didn't but. even mention the, uh, when the Lowborn first get to Dragonstone either, the the dragon priests or the ones that help tame the dragons, they are they are completely against this whole thing. They're like, we're not letting a Lowborn ride a dragon, so they peace out. So Rhaenyra kind of takes it upon herself to go forward with this ritual, which I think is pretty impressive. I mean, first and foremost, I don't blame them one bit. The last time they did, like two of their people got burned to death while Well, uh, even then though, they were they were willing to do it because I can't remember his name, but he was from a Dark, highborn family. Dark Darkling. Darkling. Yeah. yeah. He's from a highborn family, and now you're bringing in all these lowborns to tame what many of the people of Westeros consider essentially gods. Yeah. Well, I think I I don't think they're all that helpful, the dragon keepers or whatever. Oh, they help I, keep the dragons <laughs> fed and healthy, I, guess, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I think that's what they do. But, like, they, like, are always, like, shouting Valyrian at them. And I'm like, the dragons are not listening to you. Like, even a little bit. Like, for five seconds, they're not. Like, if they wanted to kill you, they'd just do it. You know, like, it's like Siegfried and Roy. <laughs> like if the, if the lion or the tiger wants to put your head in its mouth it's gonna put your head in its mouth um yeah i wonder do you think that'll have implications upcoming i think it might i mean i don't think rainier is gonna have the time to be taking care of the dragons constantly who knows maybe they'll turn around and because they've, they've pled fealty to her? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean... Because who's going to take care of the dragons if they're not there? I mean, that's kind of the thing. It's like, who are they sworn to? The, the people or the dragons? Yeah, I don't know. I would imagine they're sworn to the Targaryens. They're like an order mm -hmm. sworn to them. But like... I see them like the... Uh, like in Avatar Last Airbender. Like the... The Fire Nation priests that Aang runs yeah. into, and like they're meant to help the Avatar. Yeah, a hundred percent. I totally agree with that. Um. Okay. Let's uh. Let's talk about this. We're talking about Damon. We're back. Yeah, we're talking about Damon. We're talking back about back in Hall. Ghosts of Harrenhal. Um. All right, before we even start this, I want to point out something that as he's walking through the halls at one point in this scene, we see essentially Black Philip just standing in the hall. You're going to tell me that this woman isn't a witch. <laughs> I don't want to hear it no more. Yeah, I mean, at the very least an assassin. She definitely, I mean, she killed Grover Tully, so. With witchy um, potions. I think that it's. Yeah. I wonder what... Uh, I don't know. I think it's just going to be so dissatisfying if Damon just, like, dies unceremoniously before he's able to leave Heron Hall after all of this fucking pomp and circum circumstance that we've had to go through. And I think that's a very real possibility. He's well, this, he gets something this episode. Yeah, I know, but he's this badass warrior, and he's got this dragon, and he wants to go fight, and it would be fitting Game of Thrones style for his character to die in Harrenhal before he ever leaves for the war. 
potentially by the witch woman. Um, also, we didn't mention this, but the uh, the handmaiden of Masaria, you notice she was in a red robe, a little, a little red witch robe, perhaps. Masaria Masande. Hmm. Coincidence? I think not. I think that the handmaiden that was in there causing rabble and spreading the word to for all the Targaryen bastards to head on down to Dragonstone, punch your ticket, Willy Wonka style. I 100% think. Well, I shouldn't say 100%. I think there's like a 60% chance that she's a red priest. Priestess. Um, so I'm interested to find out what, you know, where that kind of leads. Um, just kind of something interesting. Maybe it's a red herring. I'm not sure. Red herring. Um, all right. So back to Damon and Heron Hall. This was crazy. I mean, I know that Damon's brutal, but I didn't expect him to be so quick to execute someone who acted directly on his orders. I figured his loyalty was a little bit deeper than that in the sense of like pragmatism. You know, like all I mean, he didn't have much of a choice there to be fair. Yeah. If he wanted the Riverlands army, he had to do that. And I think that's what we get after it's done. He kind of instantly it goes from him swinging that sword into him being into another dreamlike state. Yeah. Where he sits down next to his brother and he's like, I never wanted this. That was crazy. He, is this something you still really want? And I think that was Damon crazy. even has a moment there where he's like, I don't, like, he didn't take the crown. He's like, I don't know if this is what I want because these are the decisions you're going to have to make. Apparently, in the after the episode, Trent was telling me that uh, they talked about, like, in the books, Damon is gone for a long period of time at Harrenhal. So, or like he's gone for a period of time period and, mm -hmm. uh, they needed to kind of invent what the reasoning for that was, but not allow him to do anything too significant in the world that would like change any of the outcomes of what happens. Um, so they kind of started doing this acid trip, Heron Hall ghost story tale, um, which I think a lot of people don't like, but when everything's wrapped up, I actually think it's going to be good. I think uh, so too. Because I'll be honest, if Damon was actually not, if Damon was not in Heron Hall, he would be wrecking shit right now. Yeah, Kristen Cole would be dead. I would. I would think. Yeah, it yeah, point. exactly. And like either him and Amon, him or Amon would be dead too. Mm -hmm. Like I, they, they, like that battle would have already happened. So I think it's probably good that there was some a safeguard. Pretty much, Which I think like, it's. I think that battle will happen. I think we will see. Oh yeah, Damon, I, Damon God, I hope so. Having a conflict before it's all over, and I think that will be the end of one one or the other. Oh yeah, do you think? Do you think Jon Snow is going to fight the Night King? I did. <laughs> I sure did. Dumb. Why would you think that? Stupid. Arya's a, a filthy kill stealer. <laughs> Terrible. So, so Bad funny. teammate. Bad teammate. Um, yeah, John so... Adam won, and Arya came in and stole that kill. So we talked about his dream sequence, but we didn't... I don't think we actually said what Damon did and what the significance of it was. So basically, we have get we get the young Tully, mm -hmm. Oscar Tully. Uh, one of our viewers out there, shout out Mason. He said Oscar Tully is a G. He's like maybe 14, 15, maybe a little older. You know how Hollywood is. But mm -hmm. uh, he's basically roasting Damon through this entire uh, conversation. And, you know, Damon, he speaks with Damon privately 101 earlier. And uh, Oscar makes it very clear that Damon has been kind of disrespectful to him, which that he could probably like stomach because of his position. Uh, this is my speculation, but what he can't stomach is that Damon authorized the murder and acts of yeah. savagery on women and children. Literal war crimes. 
Yeah. Uh, for Lord Blackwood to commit on House Bracken. The Brackens, yeah. And I, the the change in tone we have from Oscar Tully this time around compared to the time he met Damon, whereas he before he was kind of just like this sniveling kid that didn't really have much of a say in anything because he wasn't the Lord Paramount yet. But even then, I felt like the entire time he was around Damon, he just felt intimidated. Whereas now, yeah. he holds all the cards. Yeah, and knows that Damon needs him and needs to play into his good graces to even to get what he wants to get what he's been there this whole time trying to do. Absolutely. And I think one of the main things that kind of comes of this whole conversation of it's, you know, a gathering of the river Lords Damon's there and they make it very clear that they kind of despise him. Uh, not just because of these war crimes that he's committed, but also just who he is, how he acts, how he treats yeah, others. Being disrespectful in their in their home, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. He treats them like they're from, you know, the backwoods. And you know, Damon kinda has to eat some humble pie, which is fun to watch. Oscar Tully be able to say these things that, you know, he would probably be murdered for if Damon was not or at least threatened with something brutal if Damon wasn't uh being held to account. Mm -hmm. So all of that to say, um, it kind of comes down to a couple of the Lords going back and forth that, uh, Lord Blackwood needs to be held responsible for his crimes. I think it was interesting too, that, um, before that even happens, Oscar Tully, it's like, I accept you as my vassal, but you've committed these horrible crimes. So like, he still wants to accept the Blackwoods into the fold of house Tully and the Riverland people, but he needs to pay for his crimes specifically. Yeah. I mean, he did do a lot of war crimes, unfortunately. Yeah. Which was um, directed by Damon <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. That was hard to watch because it's like that guy was literally begging for his life. He's like, please, your grace. Like, I only did exactly what you ordered. Like, at first he's like, tell him. Tell him what's up. And he's yeah. like, seriously, tell them. Tell them right now, though. Seriously, tell them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll tell him. Sorry. <sighs> Boy, Yep. Had to do what a king has to do. Making tough choices. The shot on his face was intense. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time also that we've seen Damon execute someone and it doesn't even show the execution. I feel like it, that kind of hit me a little bit harder too. Because like this is someone that we don't want to see die necessarily. Yeah, they've committed horrible crimes, but yeah. we haven't seen them do this. And they were acting directly under Damon, which is a character we should be kind of rooting for. Sort of. Yeah. He's not necessarily totally evil. Um. But that stuck with me that we didn't even see the execution, like the slot yeah. itself. Yeah, it was just much more. It's clear that his entire period of time in Heron Hall is all about something that's going to happen to him psychologically. I, I think, think he's. I think it's complete change in perspective and a change in his who he is as a man. I hope so, but I think also it could just be he has like a complete break. Because of the guilt that he's clearly living with and the continued acts of like terrible, terrible malice that he's having to inflict on other people for a pursuit of something that he's not even sure he wants at this point. Mm -hmm. I think, I think at some point, I, I don't know. I don't think he'll walk away, but like his, his loyalty to his lineage and stuff is too deep, but like, I think he's much more willing to relinquish any thought of taking the throne and having Rhaenyra come if she wants to. I think that's kind of gone by the wayside. I think he will kind of, yes. you know, let Rhaenyra succeed him in that line. Yeah, I mean, flip side, become king, come back, and just absolutely roast Oscar Tully in a brazen bull. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, River Lord. You know what we do to fish? We fry them. <laughs> um, all right. 
so yeah i mean that that scene was really intense that one in particular stood out to me even even um like the dragon pit scene was obviously awesome and badass and was like the pinnacle of the episode but like emotionally the the scene of damon executing lord ba blackwood hit harder than any any of the deaths of those randos yeah i mean and, this is what th this whole culmination of being in heron hall has led up to also like he's finally got his army yes he did the thing do you think he brings alice rivers um, also also where did he did he clarify where he's gonna march with that army or what he's gonna do with that i don't, I don't think know he if he's said. clarified it yet i think they were just yeah. gathering at heron hall for now well he needs to answer a freaking raven dude they've sent him like 50 well they rhaenyra has one of her councilmen riding to meet him well yeah because he won't answer the freaking ravens hopefully that gets him kicking into gear and start moving that army somewhere well, I think he's just like I'm not gonna answer anything until I get until the, I army. Have the army. Yeah, which you know that's a very, very damn thing to do. But um, anything I missed? I kind of just wrote the broad strokes down on the episode. Oh, yes. Well, the, the last yeah, <laughs> the yeah. last scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anything prior to the last scene? No, I think we've kind of touched about? everything that's been in this episode. Besides that, so let's talk about the joy ride. Yeah, well, I don't think it was necessarily a joyride. I think it's played off as a joyride at first. It's like if you took a joyride in Bumblebee from Transformers and didn't know that it was Bumblebee. Yeah. Um, Brandon, why don't you break that one down? Sure. So we have Eamon sitting in his council room speaking with Laris and Sir Wild, and you can hear on the from the outside the small folk yelling, Dragon! dragon and so of course I, I really like what they do here they have laris and sir wild kind of give each other a look like i told you and maybe laris just like yeah whatever <laughs> this is information i just didn't necessarily want to share uh you have aemon then look out the window see the dragon instantly jumps into action rides out to vagar to go pursue this unknown rider that's so haphazardly flying over King's Landing. <laughs> and we find out that it's Ulf on Silverwing flying through. Which at first I was like, oh, man, I hope Ulf didn't just take the dragon without letting Rhaenyra know that he had tamed it. And is going back to just show his buddy, his drinking buddy, look at me! I'm on a dragon! <laughs> I told you! <laughs> that but is we hilarious. Have, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have Aemon and Vagar per they're in hot pursuit of Ulf as he's flying back to Dragonstone. And this really was, to me, just a bait to bring Aemon there to show him, like, hey, listen, we have new dragon riders. We have more dragons than you now. Because he flies up to the island and he can see Rhaenyra is walking out of the pit. She has uh, Cyrax. You see um, Vermithor sitting there as well. And last but not least, Quintilatrops. <laughs> you threw me off there. the last dragon of the pack oh yeah that one <laughs> the biggest of all my favorite larger than vega <laughs> <laughs> um but i feel like this is the first time in a long time that we've seen aemon have any kind of hesitation for like confrontation he is riding up to dragon in hot pursuit of of this unknown rider to him and once he sees these other dragons just sitting out there, I think he kind of starts to grasp what's happening and orders Vega to turn around and flee back to King's Landing. Yeah. And Vagar resists, actually, which was crazy. Vagar always resists. Vagar just does what Vagar does because she's a big girl. I, um, that final frame, I don't think it. I'll have to, uh, I'll pull a screenshot up of it, but basically the final frame of this episode with Rhaenyra and the three dragons on the hillside on the island as Aemon flies kind of towards them and realizes and turns around. That was, that was giving me mad Daenerys Targaryen vibes. Yeah. Yeah. That. 
Yeah, did you get that vibe from mm -hmm. when, when she first had her three dragons? Yep. And I mean, this is a complete I think, power shift here. At this point, Eamon thinks that he's in total control. He has the biggest dragon. They don't have very many dragons left. They're The biggest that they had is down. So, this is a big change-up. Yeah, here, I got the... Sorry, it took me so long. I got the image pulled up here. I lied. There we go. Um, yeah, this one right here. It gave me 100%... Daenerys Targaryen vibes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was even another dragon in frame there's, on the left. There's one up top there. on, on the, Oh, uh, on the, yeah, the, up on the, on the rampart. That's where Elf lands. Yeah, Elf and Silverwing land there. Yeah, so that was, I mean, that was so cool, so sick, like, balance the scales. Um, I yeah, I mean, balance the scales. The scales are more in her favor now. Well, I'm just interested to see now at this point, Brandon. Like, I think maybe just a scale on how long this show's going to be would help me temper my expectations True. so that I'm not like frustrated when things aren't happening at a pace that I want. If I know it's five seasons or whatever, or six seasons, all right, fair enough. Like, I'm in for the ride. But if it's only like two more them. seasons, I want to see. I can see them doing like four seasons. Four or five seasons, I think, is kind of the sweet spot. Yeah, I think five would be good. But, um, yeah, I mean, I thought that was crazy. Like you said, Eamon's, the dynamic for Eamon's power has shifted. And Rainier is seemingly firmly in control. She's got the small folk in King's Landing geeking out. She's got the Targaryen bastards gathered in mass to test Whoever's alive, I guess. I guess all the dragons are gone, though. So mm -hmm. um, so she's got all of her dragons seated. And uh, am I missing anything? No, I think that's about it. Yeah, all the pieces are set. Allison's going back to King's Landing. Hip, hip, hooray. We didn't see anything from Chris and Cole this week. Because <laughs> he's a little hoe. We did not. Um, Although in the spoilers for next episode, it does show Kristen Cole, so I'm sure he has some kind of role to play. Good, good. Important. All right. Well, <laughs> Brandon, any final thoughts? I am ready for the finale of season two. That is my final thought. And I'm excited to see what they do with you. Me as well. I'm looking forward to it. I am... Yeah, most excited for Hugh, but I think all three of the new Dragon Riders will be interesting. I guess all four. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Um, with that being said, thank you so much for joining us uh, this week on the Geek Peak Podcast. Next week, we're going to be covering the finale of House of the Dragon Season 2, yes, yes, which, yes. which I'm sure there will be some sparks flying for that one. So we'll be coming back in on Monday for that one. So be sure to tune in. Additionally, we're going to be talking. Uh, we just did our review of Twisters that Trent and his brother, who is a meteorologist, broke down the accuracy of that film, which uh, that's a great watch or listen if you haven't checked that one out. But we're going to be doing A Quiet Place, Day Zero or Day One, whatever it was called. Um Trent and I are going to review that. And then Brandon, Trent and I are going to review Wolverine and Deadpool. Oh yeah. Um, and that might be a little delayed, not because we didn't enjoy the movie, but we're committed to finishing out house of the dragon. We got to make sure that we finish our coverage. So as soon as house of the dragons wrapped up, we're going to start dropping some movie reviews of some really good films. We also want to do long legs, that's mm -hmm. one that we've discussed. Um, and we may even end up dropping that review in October, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll drop it early for Patreon members just because we love y'all. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions, thoughts about House of the Dragon or our opinions on it, uh, if you agreed with us or disliked anything we said, 
hit us up on social media or in the comments of the video. All right. We'll see you next week from the summit, the Geek Peak.